Well, hey, everybody, welcome to Profiling Evil Live. I'm Mike King, and I am really kind of jazzed up. My wife's uh, away tonight, and I thought, I haven't been live for quite a while. So I called my buddy Tommy Joyce, former commander of the Cold Case Unit in New York City uh, for the NYPD, uh, working out of Brooklyn. And I said, Tommy, we've been on uh, court TV and stuff together Let's uh, let's get on and chat. So, Tommy, well, welcome aboard. It's great to have you here, brother. Oh, thank you, Mike, and uh, welcome everybody. And happy to see everybody and hear everybody. Yeah, people are people are starting to pour in. We'll give them a minute to to come in and just say hello to a couple of folks. Uh, I know. So, Southern Sass has been here since about uh, I don't know 40, 45 minutes ago. Got on and started waiting and. Uh, people are waiting. Candy Scarrett, uh, thank you, Jane. A. Um, just a batch of you starting to roll in, and I'm really excited to spend a little time tonight talking about the Madeline McCann case. Tommy, we spent some time on Court TV last night chatting about the case. You and I have talked about this case for some time. I mean, this thing's 17 years. This one's been going. Yeah, 17 years of, of that precious little girl, and I can't even imagine the people that love her and, and were dear to her, what they're feeling. But um, as, as homicide investigators and detectives, um, we both know how important it is to just keep working and hashtag never give up. So, um, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, you Tommy, know, that brings up a really interesting question I thought would be kind of fun to lead off with because cops are so laser focused on the elements of the crime and collecting evidence and trying to interview and watching behavior. And uh, people sometimes think that there's uh, not a lot of passion or feeling for the pain that people are going through, but it's more about learning how to put it on a shelf but you're always going to deal with it, aren't you? Somewhere down the line in your life. Yeah, I think that's true. I don't know when that actually happens. There's some cases that I still haven't resolved, if, if you will. But um, the passion is there. The homicide detectives and the criminal investigators that work these cases, um, uh, they, they will go through walls and they will do everything they can all the time and and you know what sometimes there's a detective that doesn't do that and they get weeded out pretty fast so once yeah. once you move from patrol into the detective and investigative bureaus and divisions you you thin out the herd if you will and really work with and and only a good detective wants to work with another good detective <laughs> well you know uh, the other thing that i think is kind of interesting is 17 years have gone by but only those who have investigated a cold case or a homicide, especially a homicide of a child, um, you, you understand that you never quit thinking about that kid or that case. And you and I have talked a little bit about places where we thought maybe uh, law enforcement fell short in this investigation. But it doesn't take away from the fact of the passion and the impact and, frankly, the the desire to do things. Just sometimes we fall short. Yeah, I think when you look at the volume of crime scenes that are within any jurisdiction, Mike, um, unless they're resource heavy, sometimes things are going to happen and, and you're going to miss some things. On this case considering the gravity and the sensationalism of this case, I'm, I'm baffled by some of the missteps at the beginning. However, given the chance to settle things down and revisit the crime scene, even though the crime scene was tainted, you still have the opportunity to go back. And if you have to explain that out in court, you explain it out in court and you let the chips fall where they may, uh, but you still have to keep doing it. You can't just say, the crime scene was tainted. I'm not going back. I can't do it. it. There's nothing to do there. That's never the case. There's never a situation, in my opinion, working on an investigation and as it goes cold and then years and years and decades later to say there's nothing else to do. There's always something to do. Yeah, well, that's that's great counsel. I mean, I give, give people a sense of 
as the commander of a cold case unit in New York City, just uh, take two minutes, give a high level of how many detectives you were wrangling, how how many cases you were wrangling, and uh, kind, kind of what life was like every day for a commander there. So um, if I can take the audience back to 2005, 2006, um, as the commander of the New York City Police Department, NYPD's cold case squad, we had about 8,000 8,000 open homicides going back in all history. So there's probably a lot more than that, but those were what was recorded. 1972 is when they started digitizing and storing electronically on a computer. The databases, everything else prior to that was on paper. So we literally worked on cases going back into the 1920s, 30s, 40s that were on paper. Um, we had about 35 total detectives in the New York City Police Department of 35,000. So what I would say, and what everyone needs to understand is that cold case is a community policing endeavor. It is an effort to show the community that we never give up and we're never gonna stop working, but it doesn't move the needle in terms of crime suppression of what's currently happening in that moment. So when you think 35 detectives compared to 35,000 police officers, it's a small percentage, but that unit needs to exist to let the community know we're never going to stop working on those homicide cases. You, you know, that uh, as, as you were mentioning that, I had kind of this flashback moment when I was serving on the VICAP board and folks, VICAP is the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program run by the FBI. And I was serving as the national co-chair of that. And I remember, Tommy, I was with a, a Chicago detective and, you know, um, I, I handled enough homicides that I stayed busy, but I remember one day saying to him, you know, you you see more homicides in a year in Chicago than I'll see during my career. And he said, and I said, you know, what a great amount of experience you're getting from that. And he said, you know, the sad part is I envy you more because you get the chance to actually work a homicide versus racing from one dead body to the next. What are your thoughts there? <laughs> we used to have a motto, go work it till the next body drops which is sad. Yeah, that is sad. So, that is sad. And so we knew that was what the case was, but the situation was, um, but we didn't like it, but that's what it was. The volume in New York city in the eighties and nineties, you know, in 1992, 1993, we had over 2000 homicides a year by 19, 2020, 2019, right before the COVID situation and the George Floyd uh, situation, um, New York City was down to 300. From 2,000 a year to 300, those are stats, those are statistics. Anyone can look them up. Um, that is an, a monumental task um, and an achievement that I'm proud to have been a part of. However, um, that number's creeping up now. But when it was 2,000 cases a year, it was till the next body dropped. When it was, yeah. and even though I had retired in 2006, um, by 2017, 2018, 2019, the New York City Police Department detectives were in that situation where we can actually work the case the way it deserves to be worked. That's awesome. And I know we've talked about you, those. And folks, if you get a minute, go back and watch the uh, interview and the case review Tommy and I did on Casanova, one of the murder cases he handled where uh, an apartment building was set on fire and uh, lives were lost. And uh, and Tommy, thanks again for, for doing that one. That was one we had talked about several times over our the time we've known each other. Sure. Hey, well, so people want to hear about Madeline McCann and, uh, so let's just jump in, but I'm going to take everyone back to the day after Madeline disappeared, March, uh, May 4th, 2007. So let's jump into this. Words cannot describe the anguish and despair that we are feeling as the parents of our beautiful daughter, Madeline. We requ request that anyone 
who may have any information related to Madeline's disappearance, no matter how trivial, contact the Portuguese police and help us get her back safely. Please, if you have Madeline, let her come home to her mummy, daddy, brother and sister. Now, I want to stop there for just a second, Tommy, because... Um, Something something really important is going on there that I don't know if people catch uh, very much. We just watched the West Boys trial out in uh, California. Uh, Trezell and, and his wife, West, had uh, two children that they were foster parents to that they were are now accused and convicted of murdering. We saw them put a plea on in front of the public that had a much different feel that when you look at Mrs. McCann in that picture there, as you, as you kind of relive that moment, what are your thoughts about the emotion that's being expressed non-verbally? Well, so what I've learned as a homicide investigator, uh, as a detective and as a supervisor, um, everybody's a suspect all the time. And I am not equipped to judge their personal words and their behaviors and their actions, I just follow the evidence. And I look at who was where, who was available, who had motive. And, you know, motives from a family could be, you know, a, 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 a fractured family that is um, broken for various different reasons. Um, we know we're looking at a child abduction situation with this case with Madeline. Um, I don't discount anything. So when I look at that, I try to watch the behaviors of the parents. And I also look at what they're saying compared to what they told us in formal interviews and compare and contrast the inconsistencies or consistencies. But I'm not equipped as, as basically just a homicide detective to make a psychological evaluation, but everybody's a suspect. And we just follow the evidence. Yeah, you know that that's interesting because um, as as you um, get more experience under your belt, you you realize and you have to kind of remind, especially the younger troops as they come along, that just because the person before them cried in a specific way doesn't mean the next one is feeling the same kinds of things. And I always think back to when I was being trained in the profiling process. Uh, my instructor said, uh, he who is good with a hammer thinks everything is a nail. A nail. <laughs> and uh, it was this reminder that just because the previous case was a certain way doesn't mean the next one's going to be the same way. And it's so important that when you see something like um, Mr. McCann's comments there or Mrs. McCann's nonverbal communication that's going on there, that you got to watch them for a lot longer get home videos, get things that can really help you start to understand what's normal behavior and isn't. Because when you're in the interview, you got one shot. Yeah, what is normal? Like, until you were ever in that situation, what is normal? Who knows? Yeah, you know, that's so right. I just I just look at the evidence and, and that's it. And, you know, you have a feeling about things and I, I trust my gut and I trust a lot of the detectives' guts uh, but we would never bring that before a prosecutor, our gut reaction, but you put it all together. And, and it's like telling a story. And if this makes sense and this makes sense and this makes sense and this makes sense, then I think we're onto something. Yeah, there you go. Well, let, let's, uh, let's jump back into this and continue that piece of discussion. Uh, and again, folks, this is like I've done on a lot of other lives where I had something kind of pre-recorded that I was just going to release as a video. And then I thought, I want to do a little more commentary. And and again, Tommy, thanks for jumping on tonight because we have discussed this one a lot. So uh, let's uh, jump back into this one. Well, hey, folks, when four-year-old Madeline McCann disappeared from a resort in Portugal, three questions crossed everybody's mind. Who's responsible for such a horrible thing? How did this happen? And how do we reduce the chance that this could happen to us or somebody that we love? You're going to want to catch this particular episode as we explore these questions and what's happening in Portugal today.
Hey folks, welcome to Profiling Evil. I've been watching the Madeline McCann case for over a decade. In fact, frankly, since it began, wondering if there might ever be a break in the investigation. Hoping, hoping that Madeline might miraculously come home and return back to her parents, giving them just a little bit of a peace of mind. You know, they've been searching for that child since she disappeared. And she disappeared in a Portuguese resort in 2007. Hey, make sure you're hitting that like and subscribe button, folks. And let's dig into the case of Madeline McCann. Oh, and by the way, Father's Day is right around the corner. And this holiday can spark all kinds of emotions for people who are estranged from their fathers. Consider checking out our sponsor, Truth Finder, to get answers like, who's my dad? Or is my dad still alive? Where does he live? Or does he have a different family also? I mean, what? Now listen, you can search for your father online from the comfort of your home, and there's no drama involved. And once you have some answers, you can make that tough decision of whether you're going to reach out to your dad on Father's Day or not. But at least you're going to have some answers. So try Truthfinder for free. I'm putting a special discount code down below if you choose to sign up. And you, can, you know, as a kid who grew up without a father, I can tell you that Truthfinder helped me answer a whole bunch of questions. So happy hunting and frankly, happy Father's Day. But let's get down to the Madeline case. This little four-year-old British child disappeared without a trace in 2007. And the case took center stage in true crime spotlights. This week, it really took center stage as German and Portuguese police launched a massive search for the child in a reservoir that's located about 30 miles away from where she was abducted. Her parents were 300 feet away on the night she disappeared, socializing with friends and many wondered if they had something to do with this case. The mystery of Madeline's disappearance has captivated folks all around the world. And I learned today that a local church there in Portugal has been uh, praying for Madeline's return every single week since this child was abducted. The, the question remains, did Maddie wake up in the middle of the night and wander off and fall victim to some kind of an accident where she was never discovered? Or did this kid get abducted? Or is it possible that her parents may have orchestrated her disappearance to hide something that happened, like an accident? You know, she'd be 20 years old now. That's pretty amazing to think of it. And I want you to take a look at this photograph of Maddie. She has a really distinctive mark in her right eye something that would undoubtedly stay with her for her entire life. There have been people that have wondered if remains that have been recovered were Maddie's, including there was even a woman who said she was Maddie. Uh, but through DNA, and I'm sure through checking that eye, they've been able to say that Maddie has never been recovered. And she remains on the missing persons list in Portugal. You know, just days before Maddie disappeared, she and her younger siblings, twin siblings, were brought to the Ocean Club Resort in the uh, Algarve region of Portugal for a family vacation. Her there we go. I want to I want to pause there for a minute, Tommy, and just chat a little bit about death investigations and. The fact that we don't go into these cases looking at them as a homicide, it's a death investigation. And uh, and here we're hearing this question, what are the possibilities? And when you train new detectives or you sent those new troops out, what were the possibilities you would tell them to look at as reasons for death? So, I mean, a child of that age and, you know, and in the, in the spot that you were just talking about, did she wander off? And, you know, you have to examine the room and examine the crime scene, the window. And what is, you know, is she capable at her age to open that window by herself? Was it open? 
you know, there's a lot of questions with that, with the interviews with mom. Could she let herself out of that room? I know her parents were eating at a tapas bar, you know, 130 yards away or, or something like that. And they checked on her periodically. Um, and then once you decide that, well, she might not be capable of uh, leaving by herself, you know, did someone assist her? Did they walk out? Were they carried out? Because I know there's some eyewitness testimony um, that someone saw somebody about 45 minutes prior to the discovery of carrying a child. Um, so I think you have to look at the missing persons case as uh, clearly an abduction or a wandering. So you've got those two scopes. I mean, it only starts to become a death investigation when time has elapsed and you're sitting at a situation where like we're now two days, three days, four days into it. And although there's a very good likelihood of, of her passing at the hands of, of somebody else or through accidental means or whatever, um, you know, you have the hope that she's still alive. And you mentioned on the court TV case the other night, the Elizabeth Smart case, they do happen, but they are rare. So I think a homicide detective and a missing person detective, when they're collaborating, they pretty much gear up and start saying, okay, it's a missing person's case. And then a certain amount of time will elapse. We're probably looking at a death investigation. And then your searches are still similar because you're going to start, you know, in concentric circles working out from the, the location of the missing child. And am I going to find a child alive? Am I going to child to find, uh, am I going to find a child, um, you know, on the brink of, of dehydration and, and illness and, and on its way out, or am I going to find the human remains? And so, you know, time, everyone knows, I'm sure your audience knows, time is of the essence and it doesn't take long from its shift to a, a missing persons to a homicide or a death investigation, whether it be criminal or accidental or incidental. Well, you know, and that's, that's one of the areas where we were um, really questioning what the protocol and procedure was in this little town in Portugal, um, because officers show up and a child is missing and it doesn't seem to take the urgency until later into the evening, if not the following day. And, and you know, it's always a challenge, isn't it? To you, uh, When does a patrolman say, hey, I got to lock this place down and make it a crime scene versus I got to get a bunch of people out and look for this kid that wandered away? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the funny thing about it. So, you, Mike, it, you, you're spot on with that because what happens is, you know, a patrol officer, the first responder in a police who has the authority to lock this down, you're talking about a resort, right? And they're thinking, am I going to really inconvenience all these people? Yeah, you are. Yeah, you should. And you should be empowered to do that because we're talking about a child here. The second that, that it was reported that we're talking about a three or a four-year-old child that is missing, all bets are off, in my opinion. And yeah. so, but it only takes experience and fortitude to say, I can do that. Because, you know, if you have a, a one or a two-year police officer with one or two years experience, they're, they're going to be very nervous to make those kinds of calls. And then they're going to call for a patrol supervisor. And then the supervisor should be able to make that call. It's unconscionable to me that that place wasn't locked down in the first hour. <laughs> I, I think that's one of those areas where we really found ourselves scratching our heads. Uh, and, and by the way, LM, thanks for that really kind uh, super sticker. It's uh, great. Folks, feel free to donate. We love having the money come in to uh, support what we're doing here. Um, and just a reminder of those that are sitting here, if you haven't been to Profiling Evil before, uh, we, we don't live off what you give. We, we pay uh, the bills to keep this thing running. But last year we were fortunate, Tommy, to bury three people, missing people that we were able to help uh, recover. And, and so we try to use the money to, to do good things. We also have pushed a batch of uh, money toward training police officers 
at the university and through the Victims' Rights Council. In, and, uh, and this year and last year, we've committed everything from uh, my Deceived book and from other proceeds to build a new children's advocacy center. So we're really excited about that. And thankfully, uh, we have these uh, things called pensions and jobs that make it possible for us to enjoy life and be able to do good things with it. So sure. thanks again, folks, for all of that. Um, let, let's jump back into this. Doctors in the United Kingdom, and they had broken away to have some free time. For several days, the family played together during the day, and then at night, after the children fell asleep, Maddie's mom and dad would meet a group of other adults who had traveled with them with their families down there, and they would get together to have tapas and drinks over at the local little uh, bar inside the, the uh, hotel complex, the resort where they were staying. The couples would take turns going to the unlocked rooms, and they would look into the rooms to check on the children to make sure that they were still uh, all well. They would each take their, unass their assigned inspection turn and check on their kids and, of course, the other kids. Well, after about five days of doing this, the, about the fifth day into the trip, on May 3rd, Maddie's parents might have tipped their hand a little bit about their children being left alone in the room. You see, they'd been having a tough time getting a table from what I've been able to read. And the media reports suggest that the family left a note with hotel and uh, restaurant operators that they needed a hotel that gave them line of sight view to their rooms because they were leaving their children alone in the room sleeping while they sat at the uh, restaurant and visited and socialized with their friends. Now, 300 feet is the distance of an American football field away. Some people may say that's a really long ways. Others may say it's not that bad if I can see over there. Regardless, the note was prominently displayed where other people could see it. And that brings me to my first question in this case. Now, folks, I'm not victim blaming here, so please don't accuse me of it. I'm just merely pointing out that we each take a role in the level of risk that we're willing to take or the level of risk we're willing to put our children in when we're responsible for their welfare. Let me explain this by talking about the risk continuum. Now, I want to stop there for a minute, Tommy, because I think this is a really important uh, point. N number one, uh, we really try hard on the channel to educate folks and to help people find ways to reduce their own level of risk to, to keep them from being in a position of the position that the McCanns are in. Uh, so, so again, folks, we're not victim blaming here, but the parents hold some responsibility for what was going in, on in the decisions they make. And I say that thinking with uh, a little bit of embarrassment of the times that I had a baby down and I went out and mowed part of the lawn to get that done real quick and kept running in to check on the baby or something like that. We've probably all made uh, a little bit of a misstep in our judgment in raising kids. And thankfully, most of us haven't had to experience the penalty that can come along with that. What are your thoughts? <laughs> I remember leaving my kid in the car seat in the car and running into the cleaners and picking up uh, my cleaning and, and, and then having somebody look at me and say, how dare you leave that child in the car, you know, 25 feet away from where you were. I was like, do you know how hard it is to take a kid out of a child seat and put it, bring it in just to get my cleaning and be out in five minutes and put the kid, it takes longer to put the kid in and out of the car seat than it would to take, get the cleaning. But I understand that as a parent, um, I would never ever victim blame the parent. Um, I understand explicitly exactly what they were doing and they're socializing and they're having a good time and at their, resort and putting the kids down and thinking that, you know, they're locked. I'm going to, I'm just going to have to shift that conversation, Mike, and say, as an investigator, I have a lot of questions. Was the door locked? Was it unlocked? You know, who had access to it? Again, talking something that we mentioned earlier, the height of that window and the first floor window, you know, could, and what, you know, could someone open it from the outside? Like how, how reasonable is it that someone could have, penetrated that window, that room through that window 
from the ground floor? Is it possible? Did they have a step stool? Did they have a ladder? Could they do it on their own? My, my focus is really on the investigation and everything that happened from the second they said that child was missing. Yeah. You know, and I want to, I want to, I had a thought on that and I want to thank Tiffany Sullivan for that really kind donation. And uh, yeah, tend to life. Thank you. Uh, Annie is just a wonderful soul, but here, here's the one thing that I was wondering too, as we kind of theorize about things, if in fact that door was open, um, how hard would it have been to go in through that unlocked door and out through that window with that child? If that if there's egress that makes sense, and Mrs. McCann indicated in her original testimony that when she came into the room, the window was open. Now I've heard some people say no, it wasn't open. Uh, all I know is what was you know publicized that she indicated that she saw the window and the uh, um, wood blinds open. Yeah, I'm just going to say as a parent, and I can't speak for every parent. But if I were to do something like the McCann's did, that window would be locked. That door would be locked. Climate control, make sure the temperature, you know, whether it be heating or cooling or whatever the situation, the weather at that time. And that thing is locked down as best as I could. And then, you know, to, to the point that you were mentioning before, did I have line of sight from where I was sitting at my tapas table? Did I not have line of sight? A hundred yards, 300 feet. Um, is it... Is it a great distance? Not really a great distance. It's not really that long. I mean, even me, as slow as I am, I can cover I can cover 100 yards in about 15 seconds. So you know, yeah. you know, you know, yeah. not the nine seconds NFLers can, but um, but maybe half that. But um, yeah, so you know, it all goes back to really what did that room look like? What were the ways to get into and out of that room through the door? What kind of system did they have, keys, and then the windows? Was it locked from the inside? Was there um, was anything forced entry um, through pry bars or broken glass? Or, you know, all of those questions have to be raised. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I know from my perspective, I don't have any insight other than what the media has reported. And there's a lot of open questions that are really concerning. Yeah, it is a troubling case. Well, you know, I wanted to take a minute and do a little bit of uh, uh, police academy training here, profiling training. And we're going to we're going to just take a minute and uh, do something that I I really uh, enjoy doing. And that is looking at the uh, risk continuum and uh, talking about risk and uh, and behaviors in these kinds of cases. And I hope Tommy, you'll just, uh, it, you know, jump in, share, and let's, let's just go through this. But, but what happened is um, back in the early days of the FBI and the behavioral science unit, after studying a bunch of cases, uh, the, the uh, Bureau came up with an idea of placing victims in crimes on a continuum to try to figure out statistically who the more probable kinds of offenders would be. Um, since uh, since about, uh, well, the last 20 years, I've really worked uh, diligently on this continuum and the processes and worked alongside uh, my buddy who you know, Greg Cooper, who uh, trained me in profiling. And uh, I wanted to kind of just share some ideas on this. First is on the victim risk continuum, we have uh, just to make it simple, low risk victims and high risk victims. And a high risk victim would be somebody like a transient or somebody involved in criminal behavior, uh, maybe folks involved in the sex trade industry. And I, you know, th I mean, think about the streets of New York and think about any community you live in, folks, and think about today the sanctuary cities where there are uh, encampments of people living, uh, Skid Row, for an example. That, that's really high risk living. Thoughts? Yeah, there's no doubt about that, Mike. Um, um, you know, when, when I think about the tens of thousands of cases, um, and I didn't go through this very sophisticated training um, that you went through and um, love hearing you talk about this because 
what I knew instinctively and what I know instinctively from years of experience, you're, you're formalizing it for me. Um, more than likely the victims that we very anecdotally, uh, the victims that we dealt with were in that high risk category. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's to take this a little further. Here's some more that we learned. So these high risk victims, transients, drug dealers, sex trade workers, uh, things like that on the low end of the risk, that's where we have people kind of like a Madeline McCann. Uh, th these are, uh, maybe it's, it's a housewife who has her small circle of friends around her and she, she goes, to the grocery store on Saturday. She goes to the school on Tuesday and plays for the PTA on the piano. But she has a small influence of friends around her or this child that has this small influence of people around her uh, in, in the case of Maddie. And uh, we, we can categorize them pretty comfortably that they are low risk and that um, they're, they're pretty well cared for in most cases. This little tyke was watched every minute of the day and night. Well, statistically, after looking at thousands and thousands of violent crimes against people, we've come up with a couple of things that are going to make just perfect sense to you. First is that high-risk individuals are usually victimized by somebody who's a stranger to them. And that person, let's use a sex trade worker, for instance, a John that's coming and picking up a, a, a female sex trade worker and taking her out. And then once he has control of her committing a homicide or a sexual assault beyond what was uh, being orchestrated in, in whatever you could call a legitimate format, but these strangers, and by the way, this is an image of one of the, I think it was the second drawing on the potential suspect in the Madeline McCann um case. The first one looked more like an egg. And a friend of mine who's a, a, a forensic psychologist said, did they ever capture Eggman when I was asking him some questions about, about this? So you always worry when you put one of these things out. But statistically, high-risk victims are victimized by a stranger. But here's the important part. Usually it's very opportunistic. A Robert Ben Rhodes, the truck driver who's driving down the road and picks up uh, a hitchhiker and then brutally kills them or the guy who's picking up uh, a, a uh, sex trade worker and takes her off in the distance. Um, I'm going to pause right there. What are your thoughts on just that first component piece? Yeah, um, exactly. Opportunistic, I think was the word that resonated a lot of times, you know, these, um, the offenders are, you know, troubled souls and they're, they're doing their thing and bouncing around and they're put into a situation and, and opportunities happen. Um, if, if we're talking about a situation with Madeline here, um, on that resort, like someone was hunting. I, 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 and again, I'm not an expert in profiling like you are, Mike, but from, from the experience that I have, um, if that, if that turns out to be the situation, um, it, that's not opportunistic. That person was hunting as yeah. opposed to, um, you know, the examples that you gave with hitchhikers and, and people who are living in high risk situations and the situation presents itself. So I'm going to come back to that uh, with you as we explore this. And folks, um, I, I, uh, I hope you're all kind of thinking about all this because this is kind of how you can do some of your own private sluicing. I want to I want to shift gears and talk about that low risk victim, the Maddie, for instance. Statistically, a low risk victim is going to be victimized by somebody who's known to them. And I'm certainly I'm right. putting the parents up because they were identified as suspects in the case early on. But he, here's the really important thing that usually when the victim or, or the 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 victim is low risk and the suspect is known to them, they're actually a target. So that takes this idea that you have. And, and I'm going to use Elizabeth Smart for an example, just from an academic standpoint, Tommy, and that it would yep. be that Elizabeth Smart didn't know Brian Mitchell, the guy who abducted her 
and took her away. She actually met him uh, once while she was with her mother on the street. And then her mother invited him to come over to the house and do some work. Right. But Brian Mitchell knew who, who Elizabeth Smart was. And so she became a target. So what you're saying is really kind of interesting because if in fact this was a stranger influenced event, I think you're dead on with your assessment of uh, someone who's hunting. Uh, but we also learned that there were a bunch of burglaries going on in these apartments, uh, these hotel rooms during that time. So how would you start to formulate based on that kind of information as it starts to come forward? Well, it's a big leap from a burglary to a child abduction, right? I think most burglars will probably um, penetrate a domicile or apartment, uh, hotel room, see a child and probably back themselves right out of there. Yeah. The only, the most disturbed offender would actually do something with that um, and, and say, you know, okay, I was here for a burglary. I was looking for property. However, there's, there's kids in this, this room. So I'm going to take that opportunity as you're talking about so I think the Elizabeth Smart um, comment that you made where it's so funny because even though they didn't really know each other closely, they had a previous engagement and that was the, the stimulus on that. And that triggered something in Mitchell to say, mm, there's something there that, that, you know, will feed my criminal mind. Um, it's a big leap, Mike, from burglary to child abduction. So the happenstance of that low percentage, I'm sure you know that and you can cite it better than I, but not impossible. Yeah, this is really, um, this is great for this discussion because what we found is you can't just stick these victims and suspects into simple buckets like this. And so what we've learned is that the entire thing is contingent upon three things, the circumstances, the situation, and the environment. And so I'm going to kind of start to paint a picture now of how a Maddie McCann can become a high-risk victim who is victimized by a stranger, whether it's targeted within a few moments, the day of, the day before, or opportunistic, I'm almost less concerned because it's more about the evolution. And that would be, we start to learn some things that take this little tyke who's low risk, in my opinion. I think you would agree with that, wouldn't you, Tommy? Yes. Yeah. Takes this little, little tyke. And uh, at the end of the day, she goes to bed. Now, there's some people who are challenging and saying mom and dad as physicians may have uh, giving the kids something to help them sleep at night. I, I have no idea. And I'm, I'm not going to, other than I want to acknowledge it because a lot of people are socializing it. Um, I have no idea if that's true or not, but here's what we do know is that they provided the hotel and the restaurant with an, a written note saying we need a table at a certain location because we're leaving our kids alone in the room while we sit with our friends and we want to be able to see them. What's happening to that risk of that child with just that release of information in your opinion? Yeah. So <laughs> that's a really good one that, that requires some, some thought. And, and by the way, uh, the, the note was actually out visible according to law enforcement in their reports to where mm. even people could see that. So anyone yeah. in the hotel would have been able to notice that. I, I, tem I tend to be skeptical as a detective. So that, I, that, that doesn't, con I don't really like that. So I think when, when parents um, kind of do these things and they know it's inappropriate, but they want to socialize, they don't really share a lot of that. No one's bragging like, Hey, I left my kids back in a room and they're unsupervised. <laughs> um, and again, that's fine if you can see the front door, but what about those other windows? And, and you, you know, you can't really tell me that the parents hadn't considered 
uh, all entrances and exits into that room. I know if I was going to do that with my children and lock them down uh, and put them to sleep where I know they would sleep through, but I have a couple of hours to socialize, I would still button that thing down pretty tight. And that would include front and back access, front doors, back doors, windows, whatever they are. The note, I'm not really sure how to process that one, Mike, i be honest with you. <laughs> well, let me add a, another interesting thing that I learned as I studied this case. And, and of course, I'm relying on hopefully reputable media reports that have gotten reputable things. But one of the things I always try to do is not take something that came on social media, but something that was actually vetted by an organization that you would hope would be a little more realistic. And that was that for five nights, they had continued the same kind of repetitive behavior of putting the kids in this position. So now we're starting to see a pattern, whether it's the length of time they spent away from the children. But um, we know now at one point, according to, to media reports, that Maddie actually woke up the night before and found her family gone and it terrorized her. She was crying. They ran back in and talked to her and made a mental note at that point, according again to this media report, I've, I haven't heard it from a parent or anything, that they made a mental note that they were going to, amongst the group of the adults that were there, take turns going on a regular basis and a regular cadence to check the rooms of all the kids and take their turn going through. So now I'm adding, and again, I want you to think about changing this child's risk from low risk to an increased level of risk. What are your thoughts there? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Mike, I, when, when you talk about the fact that Maddie had this outburst, like, wouldn't you have cor corrected your behavior at that point? So <laughs> yeah. maybe so, they thought they did by what they yeah. put in play. So again, I'm going to go back to the detective in me and saying everyone's a suspect, whether it be the parents, people known to them, other friends, and ultimately everything in between from workers at the resort to complete strangers. Um, you know, we haven't even talked about how do you even get on that property? Uh, I'm not familiar with what the security measures are. But going back to the parents and their behavior, um, what it really boils down to is if they are innocent of any involvement on this, it's horrific and what a level of guilt that they must be going through. But on the other side of it is there's there's a lot of unanswered questions. Yeah, it really is. It's uh, it's really sad. Uh, you know, I I, I uh, you know that I interviewed Richard Ramirez on a number of occasions, the Night Stalker out of California, serial killer. And I wanted to just bring up a point. Richard Ramirez started as a burglar in a hotel chain. Yes, uh, and uh, that was his first victim when he uh, sexually assaulted her, and the husband came in. And if you remember, the husband tuned him up and and uh, kind of beat him to a pulp and he was arrested. But that yep. was uh, part of that early stage. Um, I know that many serial rapists that I talked to over the course of my career talked about the fact that burglary was the place they started and seeing people sleeping in their beds created fantasy. They didn't react immediately, but what yep. they did is they started to fantasize and they evolved into a sexual predator rather than a burglar. And then the burglary just became important important part of things to help pay bills kind of a thing but uh anyway just another little side note so we see now uh this little tyke's risk level starting to increase and that we know then that as these things happen or an opportunistic predator is wandering the area and sees these children maybe night after night if that's accurate or just one time in an opportunistic way. That's when we can see uh, someone who is a low risk victim raise up and become high risk and completely change what started as a very simplistic model that says low risk are always victimized by someone who's known or close to them and why that same person could actually have been uh, victimized by someone else. And I've often wondered 
this little continuum is so easy in my mind to use. I've often wondered if this would have helped law enforcement more quickly resolve whether mom and dad were involved or not and maybe saved a lot of people a lot of heartache and helped continue to focus the investigation in the right way. And I guess that's the question that I'm going to leave you with as I cl- clear off on this is as a commander of the cold case unit, yeah, what point do you say uh, that's helpful or not helpful? Yeah, you know, <laughs> everything is helpful because it's all about information. But, you know, the thing we, we didn't really talk about today is, you know, we talked about the parents being suspects or not. But what if something happened accidentally and then it's a cover up of an accident? And so they're not intentional suspects, but something happened and they and their negligence or their recklessness caused something and then the cover up is really what we're talking about here so that you know i mike we're 52 minutes in and we could probably go on for hours and hours and hours but <laughs> i just want to raise that um and 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 you and i talked about this yesterday and we talked about this in the past um, the idea that you identify a suspect and you formally name a suspect as um, I, I never did that in hundreds and hundreds of live cases and thousands of cold cases that I investigated. We never formally announced who a suspect is. You, yeah. you just let the evidence take you to the suspect. And no one ever said, OK, let's tell the media this is our suspect or that we have a suspect where we're not going to release their name to you. However, we're focused on this person. I'm not focused on any person. I'm focused on the evidence. And if the evidence takes me to that person, then so be it. So um, the idea of Madeline, I'm still as a cold case detective and as a, as a police officer, the low risk, continuum the victim continuum that you're talking about low risk with a stranger is so remote but it's not out of the possibility yeah really interesting um you know and i love the fact that you brought out because we've talked about this on a number of occasions that it is um really dangerous when people predefine what direction they're going instead of letting the investigation take them. And I, I remember again, some things, you know, like you just remember, I don't remember a lot, but, and I've said a lot on this show. And that was that, uh, that uh, Sherlock Holmes quote by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, that it's a capital mistake to theorize before you have facts because insensibly you spend all your time twisting the facts to meet your theory rather than letting the facts unfold and and, uh, he, and reveal the killer. So, um, yeah, time is going so fast, Tommy. I just love visiting with you. Uh, let, let me jump back in and we'll catch up a little further because we're going to talk about uh, a couple of things that we covered on Court TV. And, folks, Tommy covered as much as, as I yapped about on Court TV, but I'm allowed to – rebroadcast my piece but not Tommy's piece so I want to apologize up front for that as we get to that point Tommy but uh, well Mike you're you're back. much better looking than I am and smart oh yeah so, yeah so the the audience will appreciate well it. in short this low risk child was propelled into a high risk situation when her parents left the room to be with the other adults even though they believed that they could monitor their children from across the complex this low risk child was propelled into a high risk condition when her parents left the hotel room door unlocked. This low risk child was propelled into high risk, this high risk condition when her parents posted this note that other hotel staff and perhaps others could see that their children were in the rooms unattended. Now let's go back and recap the major events that happened in this case to kind of have a little timeline in our mind. Again, five days before Madeline disappeared, 
the McCann family arrived at the Ocean Club complex for their holiday. Madeline was a week shy of her fourth birthday. She had twin siblings, a boy and a girl who were two years younger than her. And each night after they spent the day together, the children would go to bed. Now, some have wondered if their uh, physician parents may have given them a little something to help them sleep or if they were just exhausted. I'm not going to go there other than to say that's some speculation out there and it has to be considered in the case. But the parents would leave the kids alone in the room and go out to socialize with the other adults within view of the room. Now, I suspect we've all been responsible of kind of stretching the tether a little bit as we watched our kids so that we could run out and do the garbage or we could do the lawn mowing or something like that. It's a little different when you're at a resort in a place where you don't know any of the folks around there. But mom and dad made a mental note to constantly check on the kids because one particular night, Maddie woke up and she was terrified when she found she was alone in the house. When she told her parents that, they made this mental note and started checking on the kids every 30 minutes while they sat out there at night. On that particular night, at about 8.30 at night, Maddie's parents met with their friends. And again, every 30 minutes, one of them went and checked on the the children. At 10 p.m., Kate McCann took her turn and checked on her kids, and she noticed that Madeline was missing. She also noted that the window to the hotel room was open. Police were called, but it doesn't appear like police took the case seriously at first, assuming that Maddie may have just wandered off, so they just looked around without securing the hotel room as a crime scene. By May 4th, the following day, everybody realized that something serious had happened. And it's then that the McCanns make their first public appeal on media. A day later, Portuguese police reveal that they believe Madeline was abducted. But they think that she's still alive and in Portugal. And I'm not sure how they came to that assessment. But they appear to be now working the case more energetically. Then the calendar slowly ground forward and almost to a halt as the investigation crawled along. Now you can read all about this case online and for those of you that want to go down the rabbit hole, you're going to find a ton of stuff including some amazing documentaries including a 10 part series, I think a 10 part series with Netflix that Maddie's parents did not participate in or some others that are really good. One, in fact, that came out about three months ago that I really thought was good. Now, on August 11th, 100 days after Maddie disappeared, police investigators publicly acknowledged that Maddie was most likely dead. A month later, they named Maddie's parents as prime suspects in the case. And they even brought in Mrs. McCann and tried to get her to confess to the murders, promising her a two-year sentence. Well, she declined because she had nothing to do with the case, and she and her husband were later exonerated by police. Now, the McCanns end up suing the newspaper over some allegations that they were responsible for Maddie's death, and they get a a huge out-of-court settlement. There also are a number of other suits that have gone on over the years, including by some of the friends that were with the McCanns at the resort. Now, a year after that point in time, a hundred day mark, the case was considered cold by investigators. And over the years that followed, Maddie's parents appeared on talk shows, talk shows like Oprah Winfrey. They even visited the Pope. Now, the reward for this case and any information that would solve this missing person case grew measurably over time. And then something really amazing happened in 2011. The British Prime Minister convinced London's Metropolitan Police to get engaged in the case and support Portuguese authorities. By 2014, British and Portuguese officers were narrowing this huge pool of possible suspects down to a very limited number of probable suspects, some who were burglars that had been operating in the area committing uh, burglaries. And this brings up a working theory that Maddie may not have been targeted 
and go back to that risk continuum that I talked about, but that she may have been a victim of opportunity as some predator was burglarizing the place and saw this sleeping child and decided to abduct her. In 2020, German police revealed a prime suspect in the case who was described as a pedophile that lived near the abduction site where Maddie was taken. This individual apparently had fled prosecution and conviction and made his way to Portugal and was there at the time that Maddie disappeared. And within a few days of Maddie's disappearance, packed up and disappeared again. Now, he's serving time in jail for an assault that occurred around the same time that Madeline was assaulted. But this was a 72-year-old woman and a tourist in 2005. The suspect in this case, the prime suspect now, uh, had served time for a number of sexual assaults against young girls. And he apparently told a man in a bar that uh, he had been involved in some of these kinds of activities. That man that he told information to became a confidential informant to police. And he told police that this suspect admitted that he had something to do with Madeline's disappearance. He also confessed to assaulting this 72 year old woman, something that he videotaped and he showed a video of himself brutally assaulting this uh, woman, an American tourist. That is something that ended up leading to an arrest, a conviction, and now something that he's serving time in jail for. He got a disgusting seven year sentence, which means he's gonna be free in three years. Just absolutely incredible. Well, I met with Julie Grant on Court TV last night to talk a little bit about the Madeline McCann case. She asked me what I thought about this particular suspect and the information that's coming to light. And I thought you might enjoy that exchange. So let's listen in. We have some outstanding law enforcement guests on the program tonight to give us some analysis. Let's bring them in now. Joining us from Salt Lake City, Utah, retired police commander and the host of the Profiling Evil podcast and the author of Deceived, Mike King is on the show. In Michigan City, Indiana, founder of Victims News Online and former private investigator Erica Morse is with us as well. And in Charlottesville, Virginia, retired NYPD Lieutenant commander of detectives and former commanding officer of the cold case homicide squad tom joyce is with us as well good evening to the three of you thank you so much for being on the program wow what a power panel this is my gosh uh let's solve this case shall we uh, let's start with this guy this christian bruckner commander i want to begin with you please my friend this guy makes me sick uh, i was doing some research and what kind of a criminal he is so apparently he's a pedophile uh, but he prays on the elderly too so not only did he rape a young girl in germany and then flee to portugal uh, apparently i read that he raped an elderly woman when he was there too so he's preying on the most vulnerable and also dealing drugs and uh, wanted in upwards of 20 burglaries in portugal as well I, I mean this guy if this guy isn't a menace to society i don't know who is and i don't know why he wasn't in prison at the time that the mccann's were there uh, commander talk to me please well, hi, Julie. It's great to be with you. This is what's so intriguing about this particular guy is he was wanted on warrants and uh, in Germany, fled to Portugal. And there, he's there during this really critical time where this child is abducted and uh, disappears. We know from his cell records that he was in the area, or at least his phone was in the area, and he's got some splaining to do there. And then we've got the fact that once this event happens, this child's abducted, he does some really crazy things from what I've been able to uncover. He, he changes the registration on his vehicle and registers it to someone else. Like days later, he ends up up at the lake where they're searching today uh, for this child. And he's found there. He's got this portfolio that's filled with child pornography and other things that suggest human trafficking. And of course, we know from police reports and other media reports that he's seen in and around the area where Madeline disappears, committing burglaries and other kinds of things. And you mentioned the fact of this 72 year old woman. We don't know what number of victims he may have. It sounds like his preferential 
uh, target is children. But Julie, we've seen it happen over and again when a predator uh, isn't able to, to accomplish and assault their preferential victim, they're gonna take a stage prop to satisfy their needs. And that very well may be what happened with this 72 year old woman that he was again convicted on and uh, led to these charges. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the truth? Uh, thank you for that, Commander. Well, Tommy, sorry, that was a whole lot of yammering, but why don't you kind of share what your thoughts were about this particular suspect? What makes him intriguing? And frankly, what keeps reminding you that maybe that shouldn't have been shared at all? Oh, you're on mute still. There we go. Yeah, I, was, I put on mute while you were... Um, you, you said it great. I mean, he really does fit the profile air quotes, right? Um, with your expertise and the title of your, your show. Um, he fits all of it. And obviously he should be focused on and his whereabouts and uh, how he ties into it. Um, he's a terrible person. Uh, the, the crime and the convictions that he has, um, not enough. Um, but again, like what took so long, like all these years later for him to come up, I, I, I have to go back to the original crime scene, Mike. Um, and maybe it's the way I'm conditioned and the way I was trained as a police officer. Um, you know, the proximity to the house that he was allegedly living in toward to the resort that that should have been something that was known back then now i'm not familiar with um portugal's um sex offender registries and the the um at that especially at that time and even even now i don't know what their situation is but um all of the, uh, we've talked about it. They, they never really took the crime scene serious. So uh, I see you're pulling up a proximity uh, map. Yeah, yeah. You, you always, you always uh, help me get to a map. And and you know, here here's the crime scene. Here's here's the the resort and where this child was abducted. And so you talk a little bit about proximity. This is by way of the crow flying uh, one mile. So. Um, you know, he's got a van, he's driving around town, certainly puts him in the area. And most importantly, Tommy, did you catch that point? I think we talked about it last night. In fact, his, his cell phone pings at the resort. Right. Now, cell phone technology in 2007 wasn't like it is today. And I'm a little yes. suspect of that in and of itself. But I wondered what your thoughts were there. Um, that, that would depend on at the time when I'm investigating. So even, even all these years later, if it was a couple of years from now, whether it was in 2017, 2019, 2020, now today, I would look at that evidence over and I would question it. And if someone were to say, no, um, this shows that he was his cell phone pinged off a cell tower at that. I was like, I would be okay, that's fine. It looks good. Convince me that this is, and, and that there's no possibility that this is a mistake. And so yeah, that would be very interesting go. to me. And, and then, and then let's assume that we confirm beyond our reasonable doubt that that is his cell phone. And there is a margin of error of distance from where he was standing and which cell phone tower he hit. Then I would say, okay, how did, and I would then go to the resort. How is this person on property? Is it accessible? Is it a trespass? Did he have to intrude over a fence, under wire, under a fence? Like, how would he be in that proximity? There's still a lot of open questions with that. Yeah, I, I that really is important, I think, to, to talk about what the certainty range is for that particular area. What's the cell service like? What's the triangulation that's going on to get that location figured out? And folks, if you pick up your mobile phone and, and you look at your location on the phone, you usually will see a little circle around that. And that thing will change 
based on how good of a signal there is out there. So when they say his phone pinged at the resort, you know, it could be pinging in an area this big, like we've drawn here and uh, could be a yeah. complete red herring that is, is worthless, but yeah. Mike, can I jump in on that? Guy. Can I jump in on that? Yeah. So I'd like to share with your audience real quickly that we were looking for a homicide suspect um, who committed a homicide in Brooklyn, but we thought he was hanging out in the Bronx around this time. And so, you know, the 2000s. And um, what was really interesting is we were up on his phone. We got his phone number and we got up on his phone and we were saying we, we weren't listening to his conversations, but we were looking at the calls that he was making. And we were looking at the cell towers he was hitting off of. And he kept pinging off of these two cell towers uh, that were about in New York City, like four or five city blocks away from each other, which is a pretty significant distance in a very tight, highly congested urban environment. And we kept we we delayed apprehending him because we really couldn't figure out where he was. And he was moving and moving and moving. What we ultimately discovered, he was in the same apartment. And if he was in one room, he hit one cell tower. And if he was in another room, he hit another cell tower. And he never left the apartment the whole entire time we were trying to figure out where he was. It was just a matter of a five to 10 foot change that he hit a different cell tower. So like if I'm doing this investigation and he's hitting cell towers at this resort, if he's hitting one cell tower and he's there and it's confirmed and it feels good from an investigative standpoint and you have confidence in it, that's great. But if he's pinging off a bunch of cell towers, he might not have even ever been on the property. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really important. And, and of course the technology today is so much better because we can actually get the device location so we can get a much tighter signal. And we've seen now like Apple, has come out with SOS mode where it, right. regardless of whether there's a cell tower or not, it's going to put you within about 10 feet of that location anywhere in the world, which is pretty uh, dang amazing. But uh, yeah, th this is so, so amazing. Well, we've taken a lot of time tonight, but I want to jump because now police have, uh, at the request of the Germans, and I don't know what your thoughts are on that, the, the Portuguese police have launched a search. And let, let's just jump into that for just a second. Our discussion then turned to a surprising turn of events surrounding the case. In just the last couple of days, Portuguese and German police have been searching the area around a remote lake, about 30 miles from the location where Madeline McCann disappeared. And everyone is believing that this search has something to do with Madeline. Now, Julie Grant asked me what I thought about police and what they were looking for in this particular area, and I wanted to share that discussion. We want to continue the conversation right now on the search that is happening at this very minute in Portugal for Madeline McCann, the young child who went missing back in 2007. Uh, and a search is going on out of reservoir. What investigators are looking for, we don't know. But let's bring in our law enforcement guests and ask them what they think they might be searching for. I want to get your best educated guesses. Mike King, Erica Morris, and Tom Joyce all on the program tonight. Mike King, uh, your thoughts on what they might be looking for and why, please. Yeah, Julie, I, I agree, agree with my colleagues here. I think, number one, searching in water, and Tommy and I have done a bunch of these water searches, mm -hmm. finding any remains is going to be next to impossible there, just with yeah. silt and everything else. Those cadaver dogs are the key to me that they're looking for a body. Cutting into that brush, they're looking for a body and maybe some clothing remnants and other kinds of things. So hopefully they've got some information that's really helping them dial in because, boy, that family deserve some closure oh they certainly do uh it's just it's just heartbreaking what they've been through all these years um so madeline mccann i mean we're coming up she would have you know had her 20th birthday um it's it's really hard to believe it's been all these years um commander uh last question to you and we're just about out of time is there any hope that she could still be alive you know, let's talk about Elizabeth Smart. Now, it was a lot shorter period of time, 
but absolutely and for that mom and dad they have to hold on to hope and yet you got to have this wisdom side of you that says the chances are getting fewer and fewer with every year uh, i sure hope it happens but i don't think it's likely yeah i think we all share those sentiments uh commander king so uh tommy let's uh oops i, I grabbed the wrong thing there we go uh, yeah, let, let's go back to your thoughts on on that. What, what what were they doing there, and what's the chance of pay dirt? <laughs> so I really don't understand the European model of German or British authorities um, directing activities on a case from Portugal. So that is confusing to me. Um, but assuming there's logistical collaboration on these events and everything is fine, whether it be water, as you mentioned in the court TV segment, um, water over this period of time with a body, um, a human remains, it, it's almost impossible to find anything. If it washed the shore or if the body was close to the water edge and uh, is a much higher chance of recovering some sort of human remains, partial human remains, some kind of artifacts in terms of clothing. If there was a doll or a stuffed animal that maybe Maddie brought with her um, when she was abducted that she held on to. Um, I think there's a chance that if that location is the location where Maddie's remains were dumped, that there is still a possibility of recovering something. Um, but in the water, it's that that's a futile effort. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you. I, you know, even just the decomposition, even if the bones survived after 17 years, which is, Again, that's a long time in water. Um, the silt and everything else would cover up so much, and there's nothing for sonar to bounce off of. That that was I, I didn't quite figure that one out, and, and maybe some of it was a little bit of theatrics. But uh, Tommy, what would have happened if uh, the German police would have called you up and said, "Hey, Commander, I want you to <laughs> to go." search the East River and collect some evidence and dig up some ground for me. Well, I would have said, what is that request based on? And I would say if that information was compelling, I might do that. But I would also say, thank you for the information. We'll take it from here. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you know what? I'm going to pause from what we're talking about and just bring up Run the World who made this $50 donation, which is incredible. But the reason it is so incredible, last week, Tommy, while I was in D.C., I uh, made sure that I was over at the wall. And I know every time you go there, we go to the Law Enforcement Memorial. It was National Police Week. I uh, visited, uh, sadly, a few old friends while I was there and uh, run the world said, this is a little late, but I wanted to thank you for visiting the Memorial wall during police week. The donation is in memory of her brother, slain border patrol agent, Stephen Sullivan, who died EOW folks is end of watch March 27th, 1999. He was 27 years old and it means so much to my family. It's hard to get through that without getting a little emotional. Uh, how many friends do you have on the wall, Tommy? Too many to count. Um, when I think you, of 9-11 plus, yeah. Yeah, so it's 9-11 on the incident, and then plus all the illnesses that are attributable to the event, and then plus all of the other shootings and stuff. It's it's way too many. Um, but, but, you know, we, we knew what we signed up for, and... You know, I, I'll, if I may, um, we knew the air was toxic at 9-11 and they kept telling us, it's okay, go in, don't worry, everything is safe. And they gave us masks and they gave us respirators and all that kind of stuff. Even if we knew that it wasn't safe, we still would have went in. So yeah, it's just what it is. And folks, uh, if you ever get a chance, go back and watch my discussion with Tommy and 
and uh, kept Steve Polakoff from New York Fire as we talked about 9-11 and uh, Tommy sifted for the remains of uh, those who died in that event for months and months and months and months. So thanks, Tommy. Um, sorry you had to have that memory live with you, but what an honor to do Thank that you. for your colleagues and, and people. Yeah, um, it was uh, very surreal. I can't even believe it all these years later and you think about it and um, nothing ever like it before and hopefully never again. Um, and it, it just, you know, my wife talks about it all the time. It's like, it's just something that happened and you just went through it and you just did it. Yeah. Well, so folks, let's get back to this for a moment. Uh, I'm going to kind of cancel on the remainder of my video because I want to take 10 minutes to answer any questions you might have and feel free to field those to Tommy or to me individually, or we'll, we'll handle them jointly. But the big question became after three days, Tommy, they announced today that they've shut down the operation. They don't have great hopes that anything of evidentiary value will be recovered. Although we know that they recovered some bags, frankly, if it was my crime scene, I'd say something like that just to keep people from bugging me every day, but I don't know. What are your thoughts? Yeah, exactly. Um, I also, I learned with the media that you have to tell them something because if you don't, then they'll run with something really crazy. So you kind of find that, that place to work with and, you know, whether, you know, if as the chief investigator on a certain incident or whoever's in charge of the investigation, you might want to have direct communications with the media or have a PIO, which for the audience is, um, you know, um, an informa police information officer who was trained in public relations and knows exactly what to tell them and what not to tell them. Um, I think there is a level of transparency that the public deserves, but you yep. need to withhold certain elements of the investigation because they're critical and you don't want to expose certain things that could allow people to make confessions um, that could trigger um, knowledge. And then you sit there thinking this person has intimate knowledge of some things and then you find out that they're really not involved, which has happened in the past. So it's a very difficult situation on dealing with something live and having the media there at that time wanting and demanding something with the sensational nature of this case. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very, um, it's a fine balancing act with that requires a lot of finesse. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Well, folks, do you have any questions it, uh, to, to answer some of your questions? Uh, only one child was uh, abducted. That was Maddie. Her twin brother and sister, who were two years old at the time, uh, are are now. Can, uh, man, it's amazing to believe they would be 19, 18, 19 years old. Uh, and mom and dad, uh, this to me is another interesting sign. Mom and dad have kept that marriage together, which many marriages don't survive the loss of a child, and and especially. Uh, one in a way like that. So uh, hopefully the family is finding a way to move forward and and be uh, healthy to some degree. Uh, who, who knows what will happen? Uh, y your thoughts on what the best documentary is to watch on this one? So I've, I've watched the Netflix documentary that you mentioned before. I've watched a series of different 60 Minutes. 60 Minutes Australia had a good one. Um so there's, there's some out there, um, whatever platform you're using, some search engines will reveal some, um, some, some better than others. Um, just as long as everyone knows, and I can't speak for the Portuguese and the German and the British um, investigations, um, but I think, Mike, you've experienced enough. We've watched cases that we are intimately involved with on the media and we're like, that didn't happen. Or, yeah. <laughs> or yeah. like, why aren't they talking about the things we know about to tell the story? So 
it's it's I would use the yeah. the 60 minutes or the documentaries as directional, but don't take them absolute. Yeah. Well, uh, Tommy, I'll tell you what, you have been a dear friend for a long time. You have taught me over and over again. And uh, the chance to to just dig into a case with you has been a real joy tonight. I, I'm going to I'm going to leave some final thoughts to you. Uh, well, I feel the same way. You and I have, have bantered about criminal investigations for a good number of years now. And we, every time we get together, we talk about them. So it's reciprocal. Um, the, the friendship and the knowledge transfer uh, is, is the same. So um, I would do this forever. And if they would, if I could keep my lights on in my house, I would never stop doing this. Um, so uh, given the opportunities and, you know, having retired from the police department 17 years ago and still involved in the technology and the discussions and, you know, the, the future uh, presented us with the podcasts and these platforms like you're doing with Profiling Evil uh, allows us to keep that conversation going. Um, I've been blessed with the opportunity to do that as a career and then post-career to just keep doing that in the furtherance of victim uh, advocacy, protecting the community, keeping that community safe and keeping the officers, the men and women who serve that community safe as well is, is so rewarding and I really appreciate it. And, and, and Mike, your platform is, is just another one of uh, the, the opportunities to, to do that and keep spreading that word and advocating for the criminal, uh, for the victims and, and getting, holding criminals responsible. So thank you for all you've done. Well, thanks, buddy. And folks, uh, please uh, make sure you're sharing Profiling Evil with your friends. I mean, we love to grow. We, we're not going to be ashamed to say that. So please hit that like and subscribe button. Tommy, we just surpassed 100,000 downloads on Profiling Evil audio podcast, which is a huge marker in the podcast world. Uh, uh, my Mapping Evil with Mike King has now... Uh, is approaching 300,000 downloads. So that that one has been really popular. And so, folks, please look for us on your favorite podcast platform. And and uh, while you're driving to Grandma Ma's this weekend for Memorial Day, uh, think about that. And remember what Memorial Day is all about. This is about remembering military who died protecting our lands. And I would just extend that since we're a global audience here to uh, even though it might not be your specific Memorial Day, please know that we appreciate everyone who has represented their countries and fought so that you and I can do the kinds of things that we do. Uh, consider joining our channel memberships. My favorite is the academy level, which, uh, Tommy, we do stuff like we did tonight with the, uh, with the victim risk continuum, try to help people understand some of the process behind the way in which we do criminal investigative analysis. And, uh, and so to all of you, thanks so much. And Tommy, once again, thank you. Folks, we'll see you all soon at the next crime scene. Well, I, I've been watching.